Portions of AquaKids have been produced with the cooperation of the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. As we continue our Great Lakes adventure, we are here at Boy Scout Landing in Minnesota along the beautiful St. Louis River. We're here to learn about wild rice and its importance to the indigenous people. It really is important to understand the historical and cultural significance of wild rice. Hey, Tom. Oh, boujou and Dunaway Mahogany Doug. What does that mean? Oh, uh, it means hello, all my relatives. Oh, and okay. so that's how we want to greet people when we're here in, our, in, uh, in Ojibwe country. And so as part of that, uh, one of the things, since we're going to talk about Manoman or wild rice today, what I want to do is first have you taste some. And it's, it's traditional for us to feed our guests always first. And so I'm going to ask that you guys go ahead, help yourselves, and then you'll have this connection with this thing that we're going to be going about and talking about today. Sounds good. Great, I'm hungry. <laughs> oh. So who are the Ojibwe people? Could you give me a bit of a background? Sure. So we're the latest group of, of folks to migrate into this area, but we're an Algonquin speaking group and we've been here for about 500 years. And that's, uh, this is our traditional homeland, this place, this river, this place we call Nagachuanung, the place where the river gets flat. So I'm a little hungry. Can we uh, get to the rice? Absolutely. We <laughs> sit it down. Let's all eat. Ooh. Wow. Okay. That looks so good. Thanks. Thank you. Ready? So, really good. Two thumbs up. Mm -hmm. So you've heard it referred to as, as wild rice, mm -hmm. but it's really a misnomer. It's not a rice. It's actually an annual grass. And it's unique in that it's only found here in the Great Lakes. And so that's why we're putting so much effort into taking care of it, protecting it, and restoring it. Hey, we're getting an airboat ride. I've never been on one before. Me, Me neither. neither. First time for everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see a lot of other vegetation and a lot of grass here. Is the rice here yet? Not yet. So what you're seeing is, is site preparation for seeding that we'll do this fall. And so hopefully this time next year, it will be here. Okay. When's harvest season? Normally the last week of August through mid-September. What's the seeding process like? We essentially just mimic nature. And so in the fall, when it ripens, it hangs off the plant and drops back into the, into the lake or river where it's growing. And so what we do is bring it on board these boats and broadcast it by hand. My mom buys long grain rice. Is this what this is? Not exactly. This isn't a rice. This is a grass. And what you see sold in stores is just a hybrid of this originally. It has some of the same characteristics, but we view it as inferior. So how did rice become part of your culture? Well, I'm told it's a long story, but the short version of it is for 500 years, we did this journey from the Eastern seaboard to this place where essentially we told we'd find our forever home when we found this food that grows out of the water amongst many other things that would support our life. And that's this place here in the Great Lakes. And so that's why it's so special to us because for the last 500 years, it's been feeding us and taking care of us. And so that's why we're back here now when it's sort of struggling that we're giving back to that and uh, doing what we can to restore it. How does it get to the point where you can eat it? Okay, well we have to send two people out at a time in a canoe. And they essentially use a very primitive but a sustainable method and that's using two 30 inch cedar sticks, one to pull toward the boat and the other to brush the seed into the boat. Each plant will have 50 to 100 seeds per plant. 
and that's what these will end up being. And so you can see that it's got a long, we call an on. It's a beard and that helps it anchor into the sediments. And so in nature, it'll fall off the plant, drop into the lake and anchor there and stay put and grow. Does the wildlife here help or hurt the wild rice thrive? Well, that's a good question. Certainly if you have too, much, too many of a certain species, such as we have here, like with Canadian geese, it can be to the detriment of rice. They'll actually clip it off at the surface when they reach a certain life stages because it's so nutritious for them. We've now moved to last year's restoration site. Tom, can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure, so this is North Duck Hunter Bay. This was a site that was treated last year mechanically about three times on a sort of two week schedule. We come in, remove vegetation, it would regenerate and we'd shear that off again. And what we end up with after seeding is we've actually got some success. And so this is really exciting to us because being this is the first growing season. Thanks Tom, it's awesome to see what you've been doing out here. Stay tuned and we'll be right back with Cultural History of Manoomin. Now it's time for Aqua Quiz with your host, Drew Cruz. I'm your host, Drew Cruz, and it's time to test your knowledge with another Aqua Quiz. The Chippewas, or Ojibwe tribes, are one of the largest American Indian groups in North America. Do you know how many bands or tribes of Chippewa Indians live throughout the northwestern United States and Canada? Is it A, 75, B, 100, C, 150, or D, 200? We'll have the answer after the break. Welcome back. Do you know how many tribes of Ojibwe live throughout the northern U.S. and Canada? The answer is C, 150. There are nearly 150 different bands of Chippewa Indians living throughout their original homeland in the northern United States, especially Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and southern Canada. We'll see you next week with another Aqua Quiz. Right now, we're at the Fond du Lac Reservation Cultural Center Museum to learn about the historic and cultural significance of wild rice. Wow, this must be the place. Yeah, check out the Birch Bark Canal. Hey. Hey Jeff, how hi, are Jeff. you? Hello, hi. Welcome to Fond du Lac Reservation. We're the Lake Superior Band of Fond du Lac Chippewa. This is our cultural center and museum. We're uh, mostly known to most folks, uh, Anishinaabe is the word that we call ourselves in our language. Most folks know us as Chippewa or Ojibwe. And we are a birch bark people. As you can see here, we have our a birch bark canoe. This is a traditional form of transportation. It's uh, total natural materials. It's made out of birch bark and cedar and spruce tree roots are what lashes it all together. Wow. We also, uh, use these to harvest wild rice in the fall. Um, nowadays, a lot of folks have more modern type canoes out of uh, plastic or aluminum, but they're just not as nice as these traditional birch bark canoes. So how did wild rice become so significant in your culture? It's a prophecy and a migration um, that we've had um, that started many centuries ago. We were told by some uh, spiritual leaders many, many generations ago to follow the water until you find where the food grows on water. And the food that grew on the water is the wild rice. So it's a very important part of our culture and our history. And this is the prophecy of growing, migrating to where the food grew, grows on the water was what brought us here to the uh, Lake Superior watershed area. So Jeff, why did the Fond du Lac Band decide this particular spot? Well, this particular spot up here, um, up uh, the river about 15 miles from Nagajiwanong, which most people know as Duluth, is the uh, fact that we have some of our best wild rice lakes up here in on the reservation, and so they were very concerned about being able to keep harvesting wild rice during the treaty making time. And so they reserved this area due to them wild rice lakes. How large is the reservation? The reservation is about approximately 100,000 acres. It's about 10 miles by 11 miles. It would be shaped like a square with one corner cut off. The northern and eastern borders of the reservation are the St. Louis River. Sticks 
they're so light? What are they for? These are uh, the sticks that we use. We call them race knockers. These are sticks you use when you're in a canoe and you bring them and have the race come over the canoe with one and then you stroke the seed heads with the other and then the rice grains are fall into your canoe. And the reason they're so light is they're made out of cedar. And if you're gonna be holding these harvesting all day, you don't want real big heavy sticks. Plus the soft wood keeps the grains from breaking also. So you gotta be pretty strong. Yes, it's definitely physical work. Um, pulling the canoe through the rice is a lot of work. And a good harvester doesn't take breaks and a good harvest would be about 200 pounds of raw grain that you harvest which would finish out to about 40 50 percent to a finished product so when using the rice knockers is the rice just knocked into the canoe or some type of barrel when we harvest we're bringing we're using these knockers to bring the rice plants over the edge of the canoe then we stroke the grain heads with the other and the, and the rice will fall into the canoe. Then we go to the other side and gently try to knock the grains off the grain head. The thing about wild rice, since it's a natural product, it ripens at a different time. So you can harvest and go back through the same area and harvest again a couple days later. So how much can one canoe collect? On average, on a good year, you can get between two and 300 pounds in four to six hours. So Jeff, this is a beautiful canoe. What is it designed after? Our canoes and, and what our uh, prophecies and legends tell us that our canoes were designed after the sturgeon. If you take a look at a sturgeon, you'll see they're just, they used to be 12, 15 feet long and if you turned one over and were cleaning it, it would look just like a canoe here, just like the ribs and everything. So they are modeled after a fish. Well, we definitely learned a lot here. Thank you for taking the time to explaining everything about your history and culture to us. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. It was nice meeting you and come back anytime. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Aqua Kids will be right back. For more information on today's show, go to aquakidstv.org. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. As our Great Lakes adventure continues, we're on the upper St. Louis River, where we're going to learn about the cultural and historic significance of sturgeon. Hey, Jeremiah, hey, how Tom, you doing? How are you doing? Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell me, so how is sturgeon and the restoration of sturgeon important? Well, historically, we had three fish harvests that we relied upon, and lake sturgeon was one of the three. And throughout the Great Lakes, lake sturgeon have been greatly reduced in numbers. What practices have you guys done to raise that number up? So we're doing annual stocking, and then this, what you're going to see today is an assessment of the success of that. And so we're going to go out and drop nets and pull them to see the adults from that stocking. Do you think we'll be able to see any sturgeon? Hopefully. Hopefully. All right. Oh, there's Captain Sean right there. Hey, Captain hey, Sean. Captain. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Welcome aboard. Thank you. Jeremiah. Thank Andrew. you, sir. I'm going to try to do our best to show, show you guys some sturgeon, show you how we uh, try to capture them. All right, All right. Mission let's go. Board. Sure, let's go. All right. All right. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go up the river a little bit, then we're gonna set a couple gill nets. Okay. Um, we're gonna set those on past locations that we've had transmitted lake sturgeon uh, visiting these areas. So whether they're there or not, we know sturgeon frequent these areas. So this is why we're going to set these areas, basically. Okay. So okay. we're gonna run up here a little ways and then we're gonna get started. All right. So where are we now, Captain? Well, here's where we're gonna start setting our gill nets. Um, we're gonna set here because we know that there are sturgeon in these areas. And we know that based on past telemetry uh, surveys that we've done. Okay. So this is it. All right, guys, we'll go check the nets over here. Ready? Hang on.
All right, guys, we're gonna check a net we set earlier today. All right. Yeah, when you're pulling them up too, you kind of want to keep it cradled like that, just in case there is something in there so it'll stay in. Okay. Anything in that one, John? Nope, that one was empty. So what is the sturgeon population like here? Well, from what we've seen here uh, on our efforts, as far as capturing the sturgeon that we've stocked in here since uh, 1998, we've caught 23 of them. Um, we outfit the fish with transmitters. We track them once a week to kind of gain a little insight on their day-to-day -day movements and everything else. And what we've learned from that basically is that the past three years, including this spring, we've actually had male sturgeon um, demonstrate spawning behavior by going to the mouths of some of the rivers looking for females. Unfortunately for the males, there are no females that are mature enough, as far as we know in here, um, you know, to, to spawn with, basically. <laughs> They're being reintroduced, but where does the brood stock come from? All right, currently we're getting them from the uh, Sturgeon River over in the UP of Michigan. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Can we check out that other net over there? Sure. So if you have one in there, you're gonna wanna keep it. Like if you've seen one come up, you'll wanna almost put it in a cradle. Yeah. So as you're pulling it, it won't fall out when you're pulling it up towards the boat. Okay. That wasn't a lucky one. All right, well, thank you, Captain. You Thanks bet, for taking man. us out and teaching us the best sturgeon. Hey, so we didn't catch anything, but we did learn a lot about what they're doing with the sturgeon population here. And they're doing a great job at it. Definitely. Yeah. Aqua Kids will be right back. Want to keep up with our adventures? Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Jeremiah, and this is Earth Edition. When you buy food from a grocery store, do you know where it comes from? For example, certain times of the year, you might be able to buy local strawberries, apples, or tomatoes. Or maybe your family has their own garden or farm. Their grocery store also has a variety of foods that are shipped in from far away. Today we have a wonderful selection of fresh foods available to us, but that wasn't possible years ago. People had to rely on what was in their immediate area because there wasn't any refrigeration or modern transportation. For example, the Ojibwe tribe relied on what was available in the Lake Superior region, like sturgeon and wild rice. Today we enjoy abundance of different foods from near and far. So in your food choices, be sure to include what is available in your area. It helps local farmers and fisheries. Plus, it helps reduce your carbon footprint. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. We're now in a kitchen. Now we've been learning a whole lot about the historical and cultural significance of wild rice, but now we're gonna see how to cook it. We're gonna throw it to Selena and Lily to see what's cooking. Well, Nona, can you tell us how to get started? Yeah, first we have um, wild rice. So we'll do it with the raspberries and the blueberries and maple syrup. So we'll be making a sweet dish with that. And then the second dish will be with acorn squash over here. So we'll be um, putting wild, cooked wild rice on the inside of the acorn squash with sage, shallots, and garlic. Okay, so we're going to stick these in the oven for about 15 minutes. And then after we cook them, we will do a spiritual prayer and then um, we'll be ready to eat after we pray. Our wild rice squash mm, dish is all done. Look at that. Okay, are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay, so you can each hold your plates up and repeat after me. Hopefully you can pronounce it. <laughs> me gwitch. Me gwitch. Adzukanag. Oh, 
Miigwech. Miigwech. So can we dig in now? You can all eat. Oh, my. This is amazing. That is delicious. You can say minopogwed. That means it tastes good in Ojibwe. Well, thank you guys for sharing with us a little bit about your uh, culture and history and wild rice. This food is so good. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. I really appreciate it. I know we all do. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, this wraps up another great episode of Aqua Kids, but this show has been a special treat for us, learning about the history and culture of the Ojibwe people, and for them taking the time out to teach us how to cook and prepare and the cultural significance of wild rice. And we'll see you next time on Aqua Kids as our Great Lake Adventure continues. Can we go check out that other net over there? Go tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs>